Irene hit Vermont on August 28, 2011. Vast amounts of rain fell throughout the state. In some areas, over six to eight even inches of rain in a very short period of time. And in our, with our topography, our steep mountains and our narrow valleys, the rain that was falling added to what was coming down these valleys became torrents of river that literally took over everything in its wake. Over 500 miles of state road were damaged, literally taken away by the power and force of this river, these rivers. Um, we had statewide over 200 bridges were damaged. 200 miles of railroad were made impassable by damage. 3,500 homes were damaged, including 500 mobile homes destroyed. And 20,000 acres of farmland were flooded. It was a tremendous event, uh, the largest in our generation, something we had never seen since the Great Flood of 1927. Afterwards, transportation officials worked with uh, officials from the Natural Resources Agency as well as our federal partners to evaluate where we did things well in the emergency response, but where we actually needed to make changes to make better permanent repairs that thought not only about access and mobility for drivers, but also the impact on the river and the potential hazards that some of our emergency repairs created. You know, one of our major overriding missions, and it was what our governor um, really inspired for us, was that we would build back stronger than Irene found us. In the world of our infrastructure and our rivers, um, that has really meant thinking towards the future and focusing on a more resilient infrastructure. So there has been a tremendous amount of learning uh, between and among uh, folks who often don't work together. And it's just one of the many lessons learned by Irene. We've used the words river stability um, for a long, long time uh, in our work with managing rivers, working with communities to manage rivers, and the definition of stability has, has changed over that, uh, over that period. Historically, if you were uh, working to stabilize a river, you, you intended to armor the banks and basically keep the river where it is. Uh, uh, out of the interest of protecting things along uh, the banks of the river, uh, be it houses or roads or what have you. And so that, the whole idea of stability in a river wa was, was one that was very closely related to a static river. Now, when we talk about uh, stability today, it's a term that really captures the idea that rivers move and that rivers uh, really need to be redefined as dynamic systems. And so how do, you, how do you use a word like stable when you're talking about something dynamic? And there, there is an approach that we've used in Vermont that's being used uh, around the country, which really recognizes that rivers uh, can be managed towards a more stable form, a more probable form that they would create naturally. And that more probable form has a certain width and depth of the channel a certain slope that the river maintains over time. It may move laterally, it may move slightly up and down, but it keeps that equilibrium or stable geometry pretty constant over time. I'm Stacy Pomeroy. I'm a river scientist with Vermont's DEC River Program. We are looking at our Flume, our education outreach tool uh, developed by M River. We use the Flume for our education outreach tool with municipalities, road crews, uh, watershed groups, and other interested folks, uh, schools, to look at river dynamics and process. It allows us to help demonstrate quickly things that are happening on the rivers that most folks can't see in the watershed scale or on the river banks um, out, of, out in the real world. So what we're starting with here is kind of a straighter channel and you'll see that it will begin to create its own meander pattern within the straighter channel. Point bars and meanders, they function as um, helping create slope in the channel and 
deal with the velocities and the amount of sediment that the channel has. The point bars set up on the inside of the bend and the meander um, deep pools are on the outside of the bend. And so over time, a stable channel or a channel in equilibrium will scour on the outside and deposit on the inside of the bars and they'll set up over time. Um, they function, help function as floodplain areas and they help lengthen the channel. So when we looked at the long straight channel, now you can see as those bars are forming, the channel is actually starting to gain length because of the sinuosity that's created and that helps establish a more stable slope given the flow that the watershed provides and the amount of sediment that it's able to erode. Just downstream from here, we're looking at um, a, a brand new a deposition that happened after Irene and it, it represents a um, brand new floodplain. It filled in the previous channel, so the river used to be bending sharply left here um, and then when the floodwaters retreated, the sediment, these large cobbles that you see that created that bar, they dropped out of the water column and stayed there. So over time, that's gonna become the new floodplain forest and it's going to vegetate in a similar fashion to the adjacent forested floodplain that we have around us. Um, another interesting feature right here is this um, steep riffle, or actually it's a head cut, that's been migrating upstream since Irene occurred. When you get a large storm event and a big slug of sediment is deposited, um, the bed will naturally erode back up through that um, as the channel tries to find its equilibrium with the, with the type of sediment that's in there and the flows. And in the time since Irene, this, this head cut has migrated probably 40 feet upstream. River scientists divide rivers essentially into two primary types of river. And the first is what we call the transport type of river, which is in the steeper mountain areas and they tend to be narrower. And um, they function primarily to transport water and sediment quickly out of the mountains. And then when the river hits uh, the change in slope at the valley bottom, it changes to what we call a depositional type of river. And a depositional type of river has different type of functions where it will um, start to meander across the valley and it'll have access to its floodplain and it'll dissipate water and sediment, which just means that the water and sediment will spread out across the landscape and drop out of the water column before the river continues down the valley and in our case into Lake Champlain. The equilibrium condition in itself means that the water and sediment that are moving into a section of the river are going to be equal to the water and sediment moving out. And over time, that channel plan form, the width, the depth, and the sinuosity, how curvy it is in the landscape, will be relatively stable. If we change the geometry of the, of the river, if we straighten the river, um, we're increasing the slope. When we increase the slope of a river, we make it more powerful. The velocities increase, the power increases, and it has the ability to erode its bed. It's now moving down. It's eroding downward. It's becoming unstable. If we dig a river out, if we dredge a river, and we dig it deeper than what would be accountable in this more stable form that we're managing towards, that depth is also going to result in increased power and the, the bed will erode further. When those rivers erode down, you get these really high banks, like you see here on the Dog River. You can see uh, a much finer grain soil. Uh, what is the, uh, the solid brown coloration material on the top four feet, and immediate below it is a very um, dense gravel layer that's, that's quite visible. That gravel layer represents the elevation that the Dog River used to be at, probably 100, 150 years ago. Since that time, the river has cut down close to four or five feet in elevation. So if you can imagine the bed of the river being right at that line, and you get that typical spring rain, snow melt, or fall rain, and the Dog River coming up three or four feet, it's gonna immediately spill out onto this broad floodplain. 
that we're adjacent to. That means that the river is never really going to get very far beyond that three or four foot depth because it, as it immediately spills, the floods can go up, the flood uh, quantity can go up tremendously with almost no gain in depth. So the stream doesn't become any more powerful to erode at a, a huge flood event in comparison to the annual flood event. That means the river is relatively stable. Now, reel forward, the Dog River has become incised, has dug down this additional four or five feet. Now that, that flood that occurs uh, every five years or 10 years, something a little bit in excess of the annual flood, is contained within these banks. So a flood that would have gone uh, maybe two or three inches past that three foot level is now five feet deep. When you add two additional feet to the depth of a river during flood, all of these finer grain gravels and cobbles in the bed of this river will move. The river has the power to move them out. And so the river will continue to uh, incise and degrade its bed until those banks become so tall and so steep that they fall, begin falling in and cause uh, all sorts of uh, uh, property damage and, and uh, impacts to the water quality and the habitat of the river. And that's that whole evolutionary process uh, that a river goes through when it loses access to its floodplain. That floodplain is the pressure relief valve of the Dog River.